This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiya Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. The longer this goes, the more likely it becomes a proxy conflict like Yemen, like Libya, like Syria, like the others in which these same implicated countries got involved. That's William Lawrence, professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, on the risk that a prolonged conflict in Sudan could drag in neighboring countries. Details coming up. Also, there is hope that people may be allowed to evacuate. And UNICEF says nearly half of the children who have missed vaccines due to COVID-19 are in Africa. These stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. On the eve of the end of Ramadan, fighting continues in Sudan for a sixth day with no end in sight. It's a catastrophe, analysts tell VOA, as parties fail to observe mutually agreed ceasefires and continue to ignore calls from around the world for an immediate cessation of hostilities. VOA correspondent Maria Madialo has this report from Nairobi. It's been six days and fighting in Sudan rages on with no end in sight. None of the recently declared ceasefires have worked so far. After multiple tries this week due to lack of electricity, we were able to reach Hamad Haj, a former professor at the University of Khartoum, who spoke to us the day after the first 24-hour ceasefire expired. Relatively speaking, uh, the last three days were really miserable. And uh, it was a real, a real uh, war. Uh, but today, I think it is becoming uh, those uh, fighting groups succeeding to put uh, uh, a kind of a, a ceasefire for one day. Although it is still holding, but with this sporadic uh, fight going in, in the area of uh, Khartoum, uh, what we call a Khartoum official or sovereign part, which includes the national palace and the head, military headquarters at the airport. We lost the phone connection several times during the interview, but eventually he describes what he and his family have been going through. I was living in that area in, in, uh, in the northern part of Bundurban, and that was only about eight, eight, eight kilometers away from the military uh, base of Wadi Sienta. Wadi Sienta is a huge military uh, area or district. So the fighting was really very heavy. And uh, because the stray time of bullets were even reaching us in our homes, unfortunately killing two persons in our neighborhood. Uh, we have to withdraw from that area, and we came to our family Al Mahdia Thora. Uh, since that time, we are safe as a family. Uh, we still need to acquire some water and some food rations. Uh, but since, as I said yesterday, uh, local uh, sellers and vendors were starting to move around within the area. The fighting that started last weekend between the Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces has killed hundreds, injured thousands, and has left many trapped and unable to access basic health care. Not just in the capital, Khartoum, but in other places as well, Doctors Without Borders told VOA. Kenyan President Samuel Ruto broke his silence and addressed the nation on Wednesday evening, saying his country was concerned. Kenya is deeply alarmed that a misunderstanding over a single outstanding item in the political framework agreement, namely the time frame for the integration of the rapid support forces into the Sudan armed forces, has degenerated into violent conflict. Ruto implored the leadership of both fighting parties to ensure full compliance with the resolution of the Intergovernmental Authority for Development, or EGAD, Heads of State's Emergency Summit held last Sunday, which included an immediate cessation of hostilities and allowing unrestricted humanitarian access 
and extending full cooperation to the IGAD heads of state mission when it visits Khartoum. Ruto and two other leaders from the IGAD bloc, Salva Kiir and Omar Gele, are slated to visit Khartoum to mediate the crisis. Saif Magango, spokesperson for UN's Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, told VOA it's a tragic situation. It's a very, very difficult situation for everyone. People are still um, trapped in their homes, unable to go out and find food, water or medical supplies. It's difficult to move personnel and humanitarian workers around. He also says the fighting should cease immediately. That's what the High Commissioner for Human Rights is urging uh, both sides to really think about the people of Sudan and stop the bloodshed. The talks were progressive and they were promising and there was hope that there would be a political agreement in no time. So bottom line is you're fighting. During the fighting itself, respect international humanitarian law, protect civilians and ensure that there is no attacks on humanitarian workers. In a statement on Thursday, the World Health Organization condemned all loss of lives, especially attacks on civilians and healthcare workers. The WHO estimates that over 330 people have died so far and 3,200 are injured. Mariama Jalou, VOA News, Nairobi. While ceasefire attempts in Sudan have failed, the evacuation of scores of detained Egyptian troops has raised hopes that more foreigners trapped by the fighting could be leaving soon. Michael Atit reports from Khartoum. Sudanese military officials announced early Thursday that 177 technical personnel of the Egyptian Air Force who have been detained in the town of Meri were evacuated to Egypt from Dongola Airport by four Egyptian military transport planes. The military said the Egyptians were in Sudan for training when fighting broke out on Saturday between Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces. The Rapid Support Forces also announced in a statement today that they handed over 27 Egyptian nationals to the International of the Red Cross. The RSF statement describes their health as excellent and that they handed them over with all their belongings. Hundreds of other foreign nationals are effectively trapped in Sudan, unable to leave because of heavy fighting this week around Khartoum's international airport. Clashes continued in Khartoum Thursday, despite ceasefire agreements announced by the warring parties over two consecutive days. Khalifa Sadiq is a lecturer on extremist and terrorist groups at the International University of Africa in Khartoum. He says... The release of the Egyptian captives is a positive move by both warring parties. He's speaking to VOA by a messaging application in Khartoum. Sadiq says that under international law, both warring parties have no choice other than to respond positively to calls of a humanitarian ceasefire. He says both the military and the RSF are expected to abide by the terms of the ceasefire because suspending hostilities has a strong positive impact on the humanitarian situation. This is one of the fruits of the continued external pressure on the parties to suspend hostilities and create a safe passage for humanitarian activities. Sadiq believes the ceasefire were not respected because some fighters have no direct contact with their field commanders. He says the RSF is now an unbounded group that lost leadership directives and the majority of its members didn't know that a ceasefire had been announced. Therefore, they are unable to comply with this practice of international law. Thousands of Khartoum residents have fled their homes in the past two days, seeking safety and basic necessities. Food supplies in the capital have dwindled, and most parts of the city have no electricity or running water. The fighting was triggered over Sudan's political future, which has been in flux since the overthrow of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir in 2019 and plans to integrate the RSF into the National Army. Ambassadors of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom and the United States, known collectively as the Quad countries, are urging the two warring sides to hold their fighting and return to dialogue. The Quad ambassadors urged the parties of the conflict to commit to the safety and protection of civilians 
diplomatic missions, humanitarian workers, and to provide safe corridors for humanitarian operations. Michael Latit for VOA News, Khartoum. VOA has been hearing from people in Sudan about the difficult conditions they face as the army and the RSF fight. Al Nur Abbas is a student in Khartoum. He says they live in the Al Daim neighborhood in Khartoum. He says they left the neighborhood because of the heavy air bombardment and the continuous anti aircraft guns. His family went to Jabra neighborhood, but that isn't completely safe either, and now they are looking for a safe place for shelter, especially since there is no water and food. It is a difficult situation, and he asks God to be kind to them. The conflict in Sudan has left plans to return to civilian rule in Tatars as the army, led by Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, battles the Rapid Support Forces paramilitary group under Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hameti. The fighting threatens nearby states like South Sudan, which exports oil through its northern neighbor, and the interests of Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Egypt. William Lawrence, professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, discussed with VOA senior analyst Mohammed al-Shanawi whether the conflict risks becoming a proxy war, dragging in neighboring countries and world powers. Absolutely, yes. I would separate out China from your list because generally speaking, although China may align diplomatically or politically with countries, they often don't involve themselves in, in proxy warfare, although they will bankroll countries and allow them to evade sanctions and do other what you might call commercial things. But the other four countries, yes, and all the others, all the neighboring states, all the world powers, all the middle powers, like the Turkeys of the world, I mean, they all have the potentiality of being implicated in a large proxy war if this goes forward. Egypt's already implicated. Not only did they have training forces on the ground there and 30 troops that were detained by the RSF and eventually to be released, uh, but some of their planes were damaged. And the RSF's been accusing them of being involved in the bombing of their forces. And often when there's trainers in country, you know, it's hard to separate a training mission from involvement in a conflict when bombing is happening and the trainers are there. The Eastern Libyan warlord, Heftar, has sent a plane load of weapons, so he's implicated. The Wagner Group helps both Hamid and Haftar and has been involved in ferrying troops between Sudan and Libya and Syria. So they're implicated. But UAE has robust relations with Hameti and has had them with the Burhan in the past. Saudi Arabia, like Egypt, has a robust relationship with the Burhan and has had a relationship with Hameti in the past. Israel has worked in security fashion with both generals. Chad's implicated, Ethiopia's implicated, and, and all the others. So the longer this goes, the more likely it becomes a proxy conflict like Yemen, like Libya, like Syria, like the others in which these same implicated countries got involved. And in those cases, not only did you have arms and financing for arms coming from over a dozen countries in each case, but you had fighters from many dozens of countries. So the longer these things go, the worse they get and the harder they are to stop because of these international interests. Both rival sides in the fighting in Sudan have backers. Egypt's military carried out exercises with Sudanese forces earlier this month, and the United Arab Emirates sees Hamiti as a staunch ally against Sudanese Islamists, and his forces won favor with the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia by battling those nations' opponents in Yemen. How could Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates influence the fighting in Sudan? Either positively or negatively or both. It's very telling that Secretary of State Blinken's first publicized phone calls around the conflict were to the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia and UAE, asking them to help bring about a quick ceasefire. Now, Burhan and Hamedti cut their teeth as military leaders, both fighting in Darfur and leading different troops, both fought in Yemen on behalf of the Emiratis and the Saudis, but leading different battalions. But UAE and, and Saudi Arabia sometimes align and 
sometimes don't sometimes realign like they're closer together in Yemen now than they were before. I would say UAE tends to have more ideology and more commerce in its orientations and is less afraid of fragmentation and divisions at times within countries it's involved in. Saudis tend to be more risk averse and they prefer to write checks more than, you know, orchestrating movement of forces. So there's different styles, different interests. And in terms of the generals in Sudan, I think Burhan may be a little less oriented towards democracy, but a little more towards stability. And Hamedti is sort of all over the map, but he's more transactional in a way that transactional leaders abroad may may prefer. So we have, we have good signs and bad signs about these efforts to get the Saudis and Emiratis involved in calling ceasefire. We've had several ceasefires called. None were sustained. The four ceasefires we've had so far did allow brief moments for civilians to get out and seek food and water and other things or make a dash for, you know, another city or a town nearby. And it seems to me from my counts that the pace of killing and the pace of injuring has tapered off a little bit because of the ceasefires. So the international actions are having some effect, even though no ceasefire is held yet. That was William Lawrence, professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, speaking with VOA senior analyst Mohammed al Shinawi. You're listening to African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For more information on these and other stories from the continent, please see voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. For world news, check out voanews.com. The UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, warns many children are likely to die from vaccine-preventable diseases due to a decline in routine immunization immunization during the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly half of the children missing vaccines are in Africa. Lisa Schlein reports from Geneva. UNICEF's State of the World's Children report shows a significant drop in confidence in the importance of vaccines for children in 52 out of 55 countries studied. The report finds 67 million children, nearly half on the African continent, have missed out on one or more vaccinations due to disruptions in immunization services during the three-year COVID-19 pandemic. It warns vaccine hesitancy may be growing. The report says factors such as disinformation about vaccine safety, declining trust in expertise, and political polarization are discouraging parents from vaccinating their children. Efren Lamango is UNICEF's Associate Director, Health and Immunization. He says the pandemic, which is largely responsible for the backsliding in coverage, worsens existing inequities in health care. And this, he says, makes it difficult for children in Africa to access life-saving vaccines. For far too many children, especially in the most marginalized communities, vaccination is still not available, accessible, or affordable. The analysis in this report clearly shows children in the poorest households living in rural areas and born to a mother with no education in limited employment are most likely to lose one or more vaccination and to face multiple deprivations. He says to prevent outbreaks of deadly diseases, it is critical that African countries catch up on vaccinations for children who missed out on shots over the past few years. But it's important to keep in mind this increased number of measles outbreaks, increasing number of uh, children paralyzed by polio as opposed to what we had a few years back, is clearly a sign that we might be facing a significant challenge. And we're calling on the world, the global community, to be able to prioritize this issue and avert the child survival crisis before it happens and before it is too late. UNICEF is urging governments to immunize the 67 million children who missed out on routine vaccinations between 2019 and 2021 before it is too late. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. Uganda's President Yaware Museveni is conferring with his party before he signs a bill that imposes stiff sentences on members of the LGBTQ community, including the possibility of the death penalty. 
Many Western governments and donor groups have warned they could withdraw aid to Uganda and impose sanctions if the bill becomes law. Savrino Twingi Basinge is a Kampala-based lawyer. He tells VOA's Douglas Mpuga that he does not think Museveni will endorse this bill because it is seriously flawed. First of all, you know, we have various pieces of legislation in Uganda. For example, we have um, the Children Act. We have got the major uh, criminal law piece of legislation known as the Penal Code Act of the Laws of Uganda. These laws, all of them cover comprehensively what the movers of the Anti-Homosexuality Act wanted to uh, to put forward. So, in my view, the Anti-Homosexuality Act, as we have, that was passed recently, which they took the president to assent to, is, in my view, redundant, and it does not serve any useful purpose. It's not necessary. And I don't think the president will assent to it, because I... all the provisions that are in that act are covered by various pieces of legislation already in the country. What is required is enforcement. So this law, as it is, in its current form, I do not think the president will assent to it. Yeah, given that situation, then uh, what do you think would be alternative? Would the president maybe refer it back to parliament for maybe modification? I think he will refer it back to parliament. You see, what happened is that ever since that uh, parliament sat and debated it, first of all, it was debated in a very emotional, emotive atmosphere. I do not think that the legislators sat down to look at it critically and analyze it and understand what they were debating. So I think the president will send it back and ask parliament to review what they did, whether it was necessary or not. And uh, if we are think forward, having been looked at ever since it was passed, I think the parliament will just, uh, just put it in the last again and forget about it. Because it's a waste of time. It's a duplication of so many laws that are already in place. Its implementation would be problematic. Given that the members of parliament was you say, were very motive in debating this bill. Would that maybe make them unhappy if they, there's no bill in that regard? It will make them realize that they made serious mistakes because the, what they were debating is already catered for. I, I think they may have to find issue with the Attorney General for not guiding them properly. And I think the, the criticism will be against the Attorney General, in my view, by Parliament. What do you make of the outcry from human, uh, international and local rights groups that co- had condemned this bill as it is? Uh, you see, the law is supposed to stand the test of time. It is supposed to be rational. So I think as it is, some of the wording in that uh, anti-homosexuality act really are not called for. In my view, it goes against all the tenets of uh, proper legislative drafting. And two, it goes to attack the fundamental human rights as enshrined in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and even in the Bill of Rights as we have it. So I think they were right in condemning it. I condemn it for a different reason. And I think they were right also in condemning it in that, in my view, it offends the tenet of uh, legislative drafting as we know it. And two, it offends the provisions the major provisions that protect the fundamental human rights as envisioned in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That was uh, Savrino Twin Basingi, a Kampala-based lawyer. He spoke with VOA's Douglas Epuga from Kampala. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhi.